Hi, I'm Dan Gelbart and this is a video tour of my shop and lab. So the shop here, uh, it's an attachment to the house and it has four zones. One area is the high precision area, the second area is the general machine shop with CNC machines, the third area is a room for all the dirty work like woodwork and sanding and grinding and welding, and the fourth area is a testing lab. So let's go over each area, let's have a quick look at the high precision area. So this of course is a Moore number no. 3 jig borer and which is quite an amazing machine and there are two amazing things about it that most people don't realize. The first thing is what a human achievement this machine is because this machine is accurate to about one micron or 40 millionths of an inch in imperial and it's accurate in every way. The orthogonality of the three axes, or the squareness of the three axes, the straightness of the motions, the actual calibration of the micrometer lead screws, uh, the trueness of rotation. So basically everything about this machine is accurate to about one micron. And you can see the test certificate which comes with the machine which is traceable to the National Institute of Standards. And if you look here, you see, for example, the lead screws, it shows you an error of half a micron for X and Y, and the error is slightly negative. And they explain in the book, as you use a machine, the lead screws which sit in an oil bath warm up a tiny, tiny fraction of one degree and this t tends to null out the error because they become a bit longer. And everything in this machine is done to this kind of consideration. Uh, for example, the headstock is made of invar, which is a metal which doesn't change size with temperature. Uh, everything is heat shielded properly. When they make these machines, uh, the people who do the final scraping they wear aluminized aprons so the body heat doesn't distort the machine. So it's done to, to this kind of degree of precision and care. Uh, the other amazing thing about this machine that because this whole industry using these machines is declining, especially in the West, you can buy these machines on eBay for about two, three thousand bucks a machine, while new they used to cost uh, 80,000, 100,000, some numbers like that. So it's quite amazing that you can go on eBay and buy a machine like this for more or less the price of the steel. Now, uh, one useful accessory to such a machine is a video microscope to locate features. Because if you're dealing with one micron, it's not so easy to locate an edge or a center of a hole to one micron. So a useful thing is a video microscope so right now, for example, this is just some dust on the piece of metal, but let's say I want to drill a hole through this dust speck to accuracy of one micron. So what you see here is a magnified view of here a thousand times. So what you see like this movement that I show you is only a few microns because you are seeing a thousand times magnified image so let's say I have a crosshair which represents the center of rotation of the machine and I line this up, but it still cannot be relied on because maybe the microscope drifted or something drifted. So the most reliable method to do it is actually rotate the microscope and then it gives you the true axis of rotation of the machine. So if I rotate the microscope, I can see the target rotating and now I can minimize the run out in X and Y. I have to do it separately in both X and Y. And now, now the axis of rotation of the machine is aligned with this speck of dust which is only about 5 micron in, in diameter and you can drill through it to a one micron accuracy. And it's the same for finding an edge and so on. 
a nice thing to have together with a jig borer is these rotary tables or dividing heads which have an amazing accuracy. This is a two axis rotary table. The inside is like a theodolite. It's an optical readout. You can read this tilt and you can read the rotation on the two optical readouts. That's accurate to about one to two arc second, which is amazing by itself. But this is even more amazing. Uh, this is the most accurate thing in the world in terms of dividing accuracy. It's called an ultradex. Two people make it, the AA gauge, which makes the ultradex, and Moore, the same company of the jig borer, also makes a version of that. And the idea here is that there are two face gears. And they have 360 T's, so they can mesh every one degree. Now, uh, by meshing them many times, all the high spots wear out and they become even, and then it averages 360 positions, and that's how it can get such a high accuracy, because each position is the average of all the T's. But the real cleverness of this that it doesn't rely on the accuracy of a bearing. If you have an encoder or any kind of method which reads the angle, if the trueness of rotation is not perfect, if the center of rotation wanders a little bit, the angle you read will wander because you have an arm and you measure how much it moved. But if the center moves, you'll get a small error. So if you calculate, if you want to go, say, to a tenth of an arc second, which is the accuracy of this thing, you would need the trueness of rotation to a, something like 50 or 100 nanometer, which is very, very difficult to achieve. But if you have two face gears, you don't need a bearing, because the two face gears also define the center of rotation. Because it cannot move this way, it cannot move this way. So once the gears are meshed, it defines the center of rotation. So this way, it rotates on a bearing just for adjustment, and then you lock it. But when you lock it, it doesn't rely on the bearing. The center of rotation is defined by the gears. So this way, it can achieve the amazing accuracy of a tenth of an arc second. To give you kind of an idea what it is, imagine you have a bar of steel, which is a kilometer long, and you li lift the end one millimeter, or a mile-long bar of steel where you lift the end a sixteenth of an inch. That's equivalent to the error of this device. So this is a general precision area, you standard granny table with all the gauges. When you deal with very high precision, of course, if you want a square, it's not just a regular steel square, it's made of granite, and it's accurate to submicron. There is an auto collimator there, electronic gauges, capacitance gauge. You can see the air bearing lays in the background. And I made a separate video on the air bearing lays that I built. And in the foreground, you can see just a spot well there, which is not to do with that. A watchmaker's lays, which is a very good thing to have because it comes with all kinds of specialized collets and gripping arrangements that a normal lays doesn't have. You can see a micro mill, okay, and uh, some sheet metal equipment which is not related to that. But what I want to dwell for a few minutes is on some older pieces, because when you watch this video, of course, the first thing which comes to your mind is that, well, the guy has lots of money, that's why he has such fancy machines. But I want to tell you how I started 50 years ago. I built my first workshop where I had zero money. So I built most of the machines myself. I just started with a table saw and a drill press and a lathe. And uh, one of the first machines I built is this brake to bend sheet metal. And this brake was made from, a, I bought a bar, which is four inch by half inch steel bar, cold rolled, and another bar which is half inch by an inch and a half. And the bars were cut by hand, of course, drilled, and then everything was welded together. And uh, I sent it out for case hardening, so everything is case hardened. That's why 50, almost 50 years later it looks like new. So what it is, it is a clamping thing on top, and two excenters coupled with a belt. 
and the extenders move the clamping blade to adjust for different radiuses. As you can see, when I move this, the top blade moves in and out to, to adjust different material thickness and bend radiuses. And then you bend. So this is a piece of steel about gauge 12. So we'll make a bend pretty close to the edge. So you can see how nicely it bends 50 years later. Once I had this bar from this, from the leftover bar, I built a spot welder here. And if you look carefully, you can see that the sides and the top, everything is made from the same four inch by half inch bar. And what's nice about this machine, in true bootstrapping style, I made this part first, the part which welds. And once I had this part, I used it to spot weld the housing. So the housing here is already made on this machine. So unlike my first shop, as I said, this shop was built where money is no object. And it was uh, built to be a shop in first place. So it's 250 tons of concrete, has all the right layout of a shop. And I'll give you some examples. For example, the garbage cans are in the floor, so you can sweep everything quickly into the floor. The three separate rooms here, each one has a different air pressure, so the ventilation system is laid out that the room with the most dust and humidity has the lowest air pressure, and the clean room has the highest air pressure, so the dust and humidity are all moving towards the dirty room. Uh, the doors have air filters in them, so even if the doors are closed, the air moves towards the low pressure room. So basically everything here is laid out as, uh, as ideally should be in a machine shop. So this is a CNC area. Over there, there's a Makino K55 mill. Uh, there is a Weiler lathe and there are some manual machines behind me, we'll see later. So, uh, so some, some small modifications I made to the lathe, which are very useful. The first thing which is useful on, on many machines is a video microscope, which are, these are very cheap, very simple to make. Uh, it's basically built out of a rear view camera kit for a car and uh, you just convert it to a video microscope. So, especially if you are uh, recutting threads or you do anything where you have to align the tip of the tool. Okay, you can see this is highly magnified. It shows you the tip of the tool. I'll turn this off so you can see better. It shows you the tip of the tool at at least 100x magnification, so you can align it nicely. Another a good modification, which is a lot of work but well worth it, is a chuck which allows you to remove the run out. Because uh, there are some chucks you can buy, they are called grip true, but they are not accurate enough because they, are, they have set screws which move the chuck but when you clamp the set screws, of course, the chuck moves again. So the way this removes the run out, there is a standard self-centering forge chuck, but it's not mounted straight to the spindle. It's mounted to a ground and lapped steel plate, which is sitting between two other ground and lapped steel plates. So the chuck can be moved by excenters without losing rigidity. The reason why these steel plates are so big is that you don't want to lose rigidity of the lathe. So this has to be very massive compared to the chuck. So if I chuck something in a chuck, I expect some run out. If you look at the gauge here, you can see the run out about plus minus 50 micron. But I can take it out by moving the whole chuck. So everything stays clamped, and that's the key, that everything will stay clamped. Now suddenly there is no run out. 
Okay, so this chart is actually more accurate than a collet, because a collet is accurate to, to three microns. Here, I can be as accurate as the bearings of the lathe will allow me. And because there is no reclamping, nothing moves after I adjusted it. So, as I said, this chuck has to be well made. Everything has to be hardened, ground, lapped, and so on. But it's an enormous time saver, uh, because you never have to use collets unless you have some thin wall tubes. And you can not only take out the runout as a chuck, you can take out the runout at any point you want. Let's say you chuck a long bar, and you have to machine some tip on the bar, you can move the dial gauge here and take out the run out at any spot you want, not just at the chuck. So if you have some crooked part and you want to machine the end, you can take out the run out where you want to machine. So that's a very, very useful feature. Okay, so this is the general workshop area and there's a manual a small mill here that I'm using as a, as a drill basically. Uh, again, some small adaptations. Uh, now, uh, there is inventory here, There's some grinder at the background. So this is a small jet uh, mill that I'm using as a mill, mainly as a drill. A couple of little things to save time. There's a laser center finder, which I already showed in another video. Uh, there is a depth stop, but with a sliding nut to save time. The milling vise, drilling vise, the vise has retractable stops inside. So if you want to clamp something, you don't need blocks to rest it on. It rests on the retractable jaw. Uh, any other thing is VFD, of course, variable speed. Now, uh, another thing which is very useful to standardize on one size collet and have all the tooling fit the same collet. So this is standardized on a three quarter inch collet. So all the tooling have the three quarter inch chuck. For example, the boring bars, everything has a three quarter inch shank. So if you want to change tooling, you don't have to change collets. The next good thing to have is a nice inventory of hardware, but not just the normal hardware you can easily get in every town, but lots of specialty items, and which are hard to get. I'll show you some examples of specialty items. I have a lot of weldable hardware, which you can weld with a spot welder. For example, weldable standoffs, weldable nuts, uh, all kinds of weldable pins, so that goes very well with the spot welder. Another interesting thing is like a, a selection of rivets and eyelets and all kinds of miniature screws and rivets down to the teeniest sizes, like this is also good for electronic work, actually so small you wouldn't be able to see it, but all kinds of miniature rivets and eyelets. Another interesting thing, if you want to make models, uh, if you take an, a small screw, it doesn't look like a big bolt because the proportions of the head are different. So you can actually buy scale screws. So these are tiny screws, but the proportion of the head to the body are like big bolts. So all these are scale screws if you want to build models. That's not a, a very common thing, but uh, a lot of people who build models are very particular that everything will be true to scale. In England you can even buy scale sand if you want to make sand casting for a model and you want the roughness also to be scaled to the model. This is general hardware. Again, there is a lot of specialty items. I'll just show you the normal knurled nuts or screws. The knurl is pressed in, but so it never looks good. But you can buy cut knurl. So these are screws where the knurls were cut. And the cut knurls look so much better. Again, if you're into this kind of small details. Another example of things 
You have a regular socket head screw, but you can buy low head socket head screws, and you can buy ultra low head socket head screws. And it's, it's lots of uh, things like that for the connoisseurs. You can buy a flat head screw, but you can buy an undercut flat head screw to be used in thin sheet metal. This is something I only found in Japan. Instead of tie wraps to hold electrical wires, you have a bendable metal strip. And the advantage of that, you can unbend it and remove the wires. A very useful thing. So this is all full of kind of specialty hardware. One other very minor uh, tip, uh, every good anvil is made of ha proper hardened steel and because of this it tends to ring a lot, to ring like a bell and you actually should wear ear protection when you work with an anvil. But one thing which helps a lot, if you laminate two lead sheets to the sides of the anvil, and this kills all the ringing. So this is just the lead sheets are just attached to his contact cement. So when you hammer, it bounces like a good anvil should, but it doesn't ring, which is very helpful. So this is a room for all the dirty operation. You are looking at a Jones Shipman surface grinder, and you're looking at later on the water jet cutter, Omax water jet cutter, a very essential machine, a bunch of sanders, grinders, a ta a combination table saw, and here you are looking at a series of furnaces or ovens, uh, most of them homemade, and these are basically for heat treating of steels and uh, for similar materials, powder coating oven. So this is the first oven I built from my old workshop where I uh, built with basically very little money 50 years ago. Uh, so nothing special about the oven itself but at the time I couldn't afford a temperature controller so I, I had some old airplane instrument which I think every pilot recognizes and I converted this air, airplane instrument to a temperature controller and it served me very well for many years. Uh, this is an interesting oven uh, because this is a inert gas or carburizing gas atmosphere oven which is done in an unconventional way because whenever you harden anneal or heat treat steels it oxidizes and it doesn't look good and also it is, is there something worse happening it decarburizes. So when you harden steel, the first 50 or 100 micron have less carbon than the inside because the carbon burns off, it oxidizes. So you have to grind off some material before you get to the full hardness. But if you harden parts in an oven which has no oxygen or even better, if you harden them in an oven which has some slightly carburizing and reducing atmosphere, the parts come out shiny and there is no loss of carbon from the surface. And usually it's done with vacuum ovens where inert gas or reducing gas is, is pumped in. But there is a trick to do it by dripping in a methanol or methyl alcohol. A methyl alcohol or methanol you can buy at any hardware store. And you set up something like an IV. So this is, when you open it, it drips about 5-10 drops a minute, just like an IV, into the oven. Uh, above 400 degrees C, this decomposes to a mixture of gases, which are exactly the right properties in terms of reducing gas, in other words, removing oxide, plus adding carbon. So this particular oven is for, especially for air hardening tool steels. So it has a hot zone and a cold zone and a boat, which you can move without opening the oven between the zones. So I'll open it and show you. So this is the boat where you put the parts in and you can move the boat between the hot zone and cold zone. There's a bit of insulation here, which separates the zones. So you load in your parts, 
you set the temperature, turn on the methanol drip, leave it at the right temperature, like say 950C for A1 steel, the right time. Once it's set at the right time, you pull this and the parts move over to the cold zone. The cold zone actually has a water-filled jacket. So even if you have heavy parts, it doesn't heat up. And now you leave the parts in for a few minutes until they cool down completely in the cold zone. And then you can open it and take out the parts. And as an extra bonus, when you take out the parts, a big flame shoots out because there is still vapor of uh, methanol inside which ignites and it flashes in a nice blue flame. So that's, that's one reason you don't want to scale up these ovens too big because at this size this flame just adds decoration but if, if you scale it up it starts becoming dangerous if you get a flame coming out. So this is this oven, this I explained, vacuum oven, plasma needle arc welder, welding corner and another very interesting machine, very useful machine is an induction heater which is surprisingly inexpensive these days. Uh, these things you can buy new for about a thousand bucks and saves a lot of time. For example, if I have a steel bar I can get it red hot for brazing or bending or forging, as you saw in a few seconds, much faster than with a torch. Now, another interesting process is a fluidized bed coater. I mean, I'm using this area for powder coating. I show this in separate videos, so I wouldn't get into it. But there is another type of coater for more critical application applications and that's called a fluidized bed coater. So a fluidized bed coater has powder inside and the powder is made to behave like a liquid by pumping air through the powder. So that's why it's called a fluidized bed. Now if you put something hot inside the powder will melt and adhere to it and the advantage is that it will coat the inside, not the outside of the part. So if I take this, which is probably still too hot. Okay, if I dip it in the powder, the powder is melting. And the difference between this and a powder coater is that the powder also goes inside the part. If the part is hollow like a pipe, the powder will also coat the, coat the inside, while in a powder coater it only coats the outside. So if you leave it outdoors, it will rust from the inside. That's the reason why all lawn furniture rusts after one year, because the water gets in and the inside is not coated. But if you a fluidized bed coat, it covers everything. Inside, it just behaves like a liquid, it goes through the inside passages. Okay, this is a powder coating furnace or oven and behind there the blue thing is a high temperature furnace for doing ceramics, for sintering ceramics. Because sometimes you want to make parts from alumina or zirconia and these materials uh, you don't have a replacement. Some stuff you need something to take very high temperature to be an electrical insulator or thermal insulator. There is no substitute basically and you have to make them from uh, m by machining a zirconian alumina in the soft state, putting them in and then sintering them. This room is mainly for testing and also for electronic work. So it also can be used as a clean room. As I mentioned, the door have air filters and this room has positive pressure. So once you clean it out, you can actually use it as a clean room or se semi-clean room. So what we have here is a laser welder, a surprisingly useful machine. It's, uh, it's not cheap. 
I think it's about 20,000 bucks in that order, but it's a very useful machine because you can weld almost any metal to any metal and you don't even need inert gas because the weld takes place in a millisecond or so or maybe, maybe a bit more, up to 20 milliseconds and it's so fast the metal doesn't oxidize and you view the work through a microscope so unlike a normal welder where you need access with the tip of the welder and you can't weld at the bottom of a deep hole because you can't get the probe down, here if you can see it you can weld it because only the laser beam has to reach there. So if you have a deep hole and you want to weld something at the bottom, if the microscope can see it, the laser light which is aligned with the microscope Actually, the laser light is coaxial with the visible light in the microscope. The laser light can reach and weld it. Uh, so I use this to weld small things, but I also use it sometimes just to temporarily at attach small things. Say if you have a nut and you don't want the nut to loosen, you can put a tiny weld between the nut and the screw, but you can shear this weld if you have to open the nut because you can adjust the power here. So it's nicer than Loctite because it can take high temperatures. So if you build all kinds of equipment which is subject to high temperature, uh, corrosive chemicals, uh, radiation, uh, if you want to secure uh, things, uh, this is in a way much better than Loctite because it's made of the same metal. It's not affected by heat, uh, solvents, uh, corrosion or anything. And, uh, you, and again, the fact you can do dissimilar metals is, is very nice. You can even weld, for example, copper to steel or silver to copper or anything you want because the energy is deposited in such a short time, the fact the metal conducts heat is less important. In a normal weld, if a metal conducts heat, it's harder to weld. This is a miniature spot welder. It uh, works exactly as a big spot welder, which I showed in a different video, but just in a miniature scale, which is very handy. This is a homemade uh, laser cutter and engraver, uh, basically very much like the commercial ones you, build, you buy, and they are quite inexpensive to buy, so there is no point building one these days. Uh, this is a diamond wire saw. Now a diamond wire saw is a very very interesting machine because it is the same as a band saw to cut glass and ceramics. So if you work with optics sometimes you have to cut a slice out of a lens or you have to cut prisms and so this is homemade uh, and it has some accessories let's say if you want to cut a round disc, you have a chuck which holds a glass and this rotates so you can cut, cut a round disc. Uh, all kinds of other accessories like a square. Uh, this is a nice example, this whole machine, all the parts were done on the water jet. So for example, these parts, everything was done on the water jet and just machined a little bit where it had to be accurate. Now, the rest here is all electronic test equipment, uh, mostly directed towards RF work, radio frequency work. Uh, this is basically all one generation old. The newer equipment it looks a bit different. It's all LCD screens and so on. This is one generation older, which I actually prefer because it's simpler to use, simpler to understand never fails, like the old HP equipment, uh, never fails. And the main thing about it, you can buy the stuff dirt cheap on eBay. So I'll give you an example. Uh, each one of those pieces cost many thousands when it was new and you can buy it for a few hundred bucks. An interesting piece of equipment is an, a network analyzer. This is a HP 3577A network analyzer. Now many people are familiar with spectrum analyzers like this one. 
uh, and which are useful also in mechanical work, say if you want to balance some, some rotating machinery, it's nice to have a spectrum analyzer, you can see all the vibrations, you can balance it, but a network analyzer can do everything a spectrum analyzer can do, but can do much more. It can measure transfer functions of servo systems, so it's not just for electronic work. In electronic work, it's a must-have, say in analog electronics, but even if you do mechanical things like servo systems, high-speed actuators, this can plot the characteristics of the actuator, can show the phase, the magnitude, everything you want. Uh, it has incredible specs. It goes down to about a microvolt. It's very difficult to see or measure a microvolt with other instruments. It goes from 5 hertz to 200 megahertz, so it covers a huge range. And uh, it measures phase to a fraction of a degree. The most amazing thing about this is that uh, you can buy that for about 500 bucks on eBay. When it was new, it was tens of thousands of bucks. So a lot of this very sophisticated, one generation old test equipment in perfect working order, can buy, you can buy on eBay for close to nothing, and you don't have to worry about spare parts of, or repair because if this ever fails, you just buy another one for 500 bucks. So it's a very, very cost-effective way to build up an electronics lab.